Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Congregational United Church of Christ. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, you're welcome here. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us in person this morning, and also welcome uh, to those of you who are joining us uh, over Facebook um, or, or on Zoom. So uh, David, Pastor David is on vacation today. Getting an echo up here. Um, yeah, uh, Pastor David and uh, Beth Astarte are both uh, on vacation today. So I'll be your welcomer today. Um, Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a guest preacher today, and I'd like to introduce her. A native Wisconsinite, Molly Mitchell migrated to Portland, Oregon in 2008, joining organizations and communities working to advance liberation. She has served in nonprofit leadership, led justice initiatives, offered training, and facilitated transitional deep listening projects within her home congregation of Bridgeport UCC and the wider Central Pacific Conference. I also used to attend Bridgeport when I lived literally right across the street. My front door was facing their front door for many years. That's actually my, the first UCC church I attended. Um, Molly holds a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and Family Studies and a Master of Science in Social Work, both from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is pursuing ordination in the UCC, very good, and is, current, uh, is a current Andover Newton Seminary student at Yale Divinity School and serves as interim associate pastor at United Congregational Church of Toland in Toland, Connecticut. Please join me in a warm welcome of Molly Mitchell. Thank you, Owen. And I'd like to invite you to stand, rise in body and or spirit, and join me in our call to worship this morning. Beloved children, welcome to this sanctuary, this day and this moment together. We have arrived. We're joining remotely. We are showing up to worship God and to be a witness to one another on our journeys of faith. We are here to learn, here to grow, and here to share with each other and with God the ways we are in need of continued forgiveness and healing. We are relieved that we can bring all of who we are to this place and to know that God not only holds us in our pain, but challenges us in our comfort to equip us to become the people God envisions us to be. Together, let us come now to praise God who offers us grace, mercy, and renewal day by day. We're going to join together in our own ways uh, uh, with this hymn, God of grace, God of glory. Um, I didn't bring a hymnal up here. I'll have to go down there when we start. But um, when, if, while we're in the sanctuary, um, we're not supposed to be singing because the Delta variant is pretty rampant right now. And so we're really going to avoid singing. Um, if you're at home, though, hey, you can belt it out. That, more, more power to you. Um, if we're in the sanctuary, you can, you know, mouth the words along. You can hum along with the tune um, or you can move your body as you feel moved by the the words in the message Yeah. 
You may be seated. Will you pray with me, church? Holy One, our prayer this morning is one of humility, openness, and a little bit of contrition. We learn from Jesus's example of how to change our minds, how to say we're sorry, and even when to simply walk away. In each of our hearts, may you work anew. In each of our relationships, may your loving care be found. And in our service, may we remember Jesus as the only savior we need. Amen. Got Lady Di coming up to share a little scripture with us. Thank you. Good morning. As a preface to the scripture, wisdom is the biblical term for this on earth as it is in heaven, everyday living. Wisdom is the art of living skillfully in whatever actual conditions we find ourselves. Wisdom has to do with becoming skillful in honoring our parents and raising our children, handling our money, cultivating emotions within ourselves and attitudes toward others that make for peace. It is the way we think of and respond to God. It is the most practical thing we do. In matters of everyday practicality, nothing, absolutely nothing, takes preference over God. From Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You, you that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come. Eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. May God add a blessing to the reading of scripture. And may these ancient words enlighten and inspire us to be God's beloved people in the world today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Today, I'll be talking a little bit about kindness as wisdom. As Owen shared, I am a student at Yale Divinity School and a member in discernment here in the Central Pacific Conference. I know that Bethel here is an open and affirming congregation meaning that we affirm God's purpose and blessing in the lives of, as my friend Patricia says, anybody with a belly button. So good morning again, church. It's really good to be with you. Today's sermon follows in a series that your pastor has had you on with a book called In Defense of Kindness by Bruce Reyes Chow. I'll be entering into the sections on walking away as kindness, apologizing well as kindness, and what type of kindness is involved in saviorism and avoiding it, and just how to avoid some of those pitfalls. In 2014, when protests around the death of Michael Brown were happening here in Portland, I got trained to be an intervener and this meant that in pairs or in teams, I would be someone who would keep an eye on the outside of the gathering, 
We would scan the periphery of a vigil and notice who might be there to disrupt it in words or actions. It seemed like there was always someone who thought that the public display of grief was uncalled for. So sometimes they'd yell out obscenities, sometimes they would be carrying their own signs. But a couple of us, trained in mild de-escalation, would approach those folks together, one at a time. We would ask if they'd like to talk, and then attempt to move them away from the site of the vigil or protest that was happening at the time. There were lots of important reasons to do this, but the first was to honor the space that was being created for the expression of public grief. We essentially were offering an opportunity for those detractors to offer their own form of kindness, to simply walk away. Reyes Chow discusses a few key times when walking away is truly the form of kindness that expresses dignity, care, compassion, the best really for either yourself or others. And he says, when it is not offered to you, you must claim it for yourself. My first career in the nonprofit sector began in the field of domestic violence. Hundreds, maybe thousands of survivors were able to escape, to walk away from dangerous situations due to the network of support offered through various programs and people. We accompanied so many single folks, families who were walking away, making the transition toward loving themselves again, toward a nonviolent way of parenting, and toward a life of more freedom. In the book, Reyes Chow lays out how his mother left an abusive marriage as an act of personal kindness for herself and her children. For years, I had a frontline view of people doing the same thing, knowing that to stay often meant losing yourself. Creating a new perspective, a view that prioritizes oneself after a long time, involves maybe not just walking away, but setting a boundary. Being kind to yourself is not just walking away when it's the right time, though it is that. It's perhaps not letting yourself get hurt or not maybe being quite the same as giving up altogether, abdicating responsibility or foregoing your commitments. One of the spiritual leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement and the founder of the Embodiment Institute, Prentice Hemphill, has a particular quote that resonates with this type of kindness. And they say, Boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. The distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. We often forget how to do both of those things. If there's a particular place in your life where walking away and setting a boundary, would be a kindness to yourself, it might be time to make that change. I'd also like you to consider helping others recognize when it is time for them to walk away. I'd like for us to try to find ways to accompany others who are in the process of deciding to make that move themselves. In the same vein of kindness within yourself, a genuine apology can be really hard to do. It can be a difficult one to make. For some, knowing that you've hurt someone makes you beat yourself up a little bit inside. You aren't very kind to yourself when you realize, ah, oh, I really messed that up. But you're admitting that you're fallible, that you're to blame, you're only human. And something you did was hurtful or offensive or both. Those are the things that are hard for me 
For others, it can be really hard to say that just we were wrong, especially if it feels like it's a misunderstanding or if you feel like your actions were actually justified. Have you ever rehearsed an apology? Maybe in the mirror, yeah. In a work setting before there was the undo button, God bless the undo, the unsend button, a blessing, a gift to us all. I accidentally CC'd someone on an email. It wasn't kind. They weren't supposed to get that email. It was trite and it was full of reasons why the person that was CC'd was not a great person to partner with on a project. And they read the whole thing. Mortification is one way of knowing that an apology and seeking forgiveness is the right thing to do. Jesus also comes on in and tells us that if our sibling has something against us, we are to go and be reconciled to them. But you don't need to be ashamed or even to have someone tell you to do it, to be able to just own when you've hurt someone. In my work in school, I'm interested in studying institutional repentance practices. And this includes a truth-telling component, a time of reflection, and also a time to make repairs. The apology process listed here on this slide is a part of the ways that maybe a company or an organization, not just an individual, should begin to think through what is theirs to own. What is their responsibility? And how can they make things right? Individually, we often have a few things we can say to prove that we're trying in earnest to change. When a whole organization Maybe their policies, procedures, practices. When a whole organization is wrong, however, and people have been harmed for a long time, say queer people in the church or those who survived sexual abuse and assault, this can take a while. Often in the process of organizational change, whether that's in the church or within our companies, what we're apologizing, apologizing for is something that maybe we thought was a good idea at the time. Maybe not intentional malice, but a way of operating that was hurtful to maybe a whole group of people. So one particularly atrocious example of this that I find myself brought back to based on where I'm going to school is the translation of the revised standard version of the Bible. That translation happened with a big team of people at my school, Yale Divinity School. There's a whole room called the RSV room. We honor that work that was done there. But that translation in 1946 was the first time that the word homosexual was ever used in a translation of the Bible. And at the time, maybe it felt like a good way to categorize what the Hebrew words were, to lay out what types of sins might Christians be wary of and protect against. If you can consider with me why you became an open and affirming church, I wonder what that means in your practice together as a community. Whom do you celebrate? Which translations do you use? Would you ensure that the vitriol and condemnation, all those messages of the past 75 years would be sufficiently stopped? That's kindness at the heart of those movements. The harm, psychological, spiritual, emotional, and physical, that's been perpetrated by good Christians wanting to do well, that harm has been epic. It's not something that just an apology can cover, but maybe something akin to institutional repentance might be our way forward. Congregations who have taken up the call as yours has to become open and affirming, step into this kind of work this type of radical kindness 
this type of organizational apology that can truly be transformative. So I'd like for you to consider with me what an authentic apology might look like. That could be anything from apologizing for accidentally misgendering someone to realizing that we collectively in some points have participated in major crimes against humanity. So kindness isn't just acknowledging, it isn't just listening and moving on hearing the hard things and then thinking, oh, that's, that's a lot. There's a particular way to honor the dignity in each person. Understand where maybe you or we are complicit. Include yourself as you apologize. You should affirm the experience of the victims not the offenders necessarily, just the victims. What are they experiencing? What happened? Did you listen deeply to what was shared with you? What is the pain? What's been the effects of that pain? And acknowledge any damage done and then offer a future change to prevent it. Now, I want to put a caveat that there are many social, cultural, and even gendered differences in how we apologize. Reyes Chow shares specifically that he witnessed his daughters apologizing at a soccer match on the field so often that the coach had to yell out to the players, stop apologizing, <laughs> just play. These steps listed here are for authentic relational apologies in a culture in which that might be appreciated. Forgiveness, once extended, might then be seen as a kind of grace and another form of deep kindness. In my final selection today, I'd like to talk briefly about saviorism and protecting against it. It's a problem with a long history in the church. Thank God we do have a savior. And thank God we are not that savior. <laughs> Continuing from my example of homophobia as it lives within the church and ourselves, saviorism has had a long history of reform and tweaks. Medieval torture devices, public shaming, even commitment to an asylum may have been actions taken by well-meaning Christians toward those in what we now know as a beautifully diverse LGBTQ community. Attempts towards saving from sin or crushing to both soul and body, stripping away agency and freedom. In another example, Reyes Chow describes instances of donated supplies in disaster zones. That's the epitome sometimes of saviorism, broken or old equipment, tools with the wrong composition for the climate that they're attempting to aid. Not helpful. So how have you been taught that Americans know better than others? We've been taught that a lot, right? I have some examples here of systemic saviorism. Systemic saviorism might look like military occupations. And we see this in Central America, but also right now as we're leaving Afghanistan. It can look like over-policing in communities of color, believing that they aren't equipped to handle any of their own issues. It looks like much of the nonprofit industry's services. They're built on savior models, serving needs in areas and with people who, if given an adequate distribution of resources, would be able to mutually meet their own needs without any type of intervention from well-meaning folks. It can also look like economic disdain or contempt where our way is better. And this often shows up as those of us with some class privilege can look down upon those who are struggling with poverty. We wanna help, but rarely do we actually want to redistribute the wealth that we have. 
so that no one would even need to live in poverty and struggle in such a way. And finally, my favorite one to talk about, missions work. Often there's an assumption that indigenous peoples were inferior. They needed discipline. They needed to undergo drastic changes to not only be acceptable in culture, but to have a chance at participation in the work of Christ. This is a type of saviorism that Christians brought, but not what Jesus tells us to do. So how have you acted in ways that take away someone's agency or dignity? Listed here, again, some individual saviorism examples. First up, thinking that you know what someone needs without asking them. Often that happens in major disaster zones. Folks send all kinds of supplies when what they really need is an influx of cash, they need an influx of helpers to rebuild. They don't necessarily need old clothing, used toys. Giving gifts that aren't helpful to one another can be a type of saviorism. Our favorite bootstrap mentality here in the US, believing that any change is supposed to happen without mutual accompaniment and support, that we'll just do it on our own. The phrase, if you just, if you just do this, if you just put down the drugs, if you just stop gambling, if you just change how you cope with your trauma, then you'll be better. You thinking that you know how someone should cope with their issues is attempting to insert yourself as a savior. And then finally, acting on behalf of someone who could do that action themselves. My sister is a capable woman with Down syndrome. She, like most folks with disabilities, has often been infantilized. And folks often assume that she can't do things. That with a little support, she can totally do on her own. She rides the bus, she works two jobs, she participates in Special Olympics, and lives in an independent living situation. Her capability though is often bolstered by us as a family stepping back instead of stepping in. Our role in offering kindness in the face of those learned beliefs listed here is to protect ourselves against falling into saviorism. Falling into it is easy. It's what we've been taught. We think we need to go. We think we need to go somewhere to save somebody who's suffering. One way that also shows up is racist ways. White folks think they need to go to Africa. They need to save the babies, save the children. From whom do the children need saving? What processes got us there? What practices were in place? Which institutions were complicit? These are the ways that saviorism can show up and ways that we can understand our complicity and start to either offer an apology, start to think about how we want to walk away. Our scripture reading today was one that embodied wisdom. It gave her a table, a voice that called out to those who might need a sustaining meal. Wisdom calls us in to live, to walk in the way of insight. Wisdom is personified in this text, brought in as a device for us to consider that invitation in a more relational way. Maybe the ways that we might also imagine God to be calling us in to bring us in, inviting us to sit down to a meal, to commune with one another and live in a different type of way. Reyes Chow has brought insight into our midst here in Centering Kindness. Kindness in so many forms, 
you've already seen, and in a variety of places. Kindness as healthy boundaries and making the choice to walk away. Kindness as an authentic apology in the repair process. And kindness as a protection against saviorism. Wisdom, should we heed her call, offers us a table set with nourishment, with company for this journey, and with all the tools we need to move into an uncertain future. Let's go. Amen. Please, please uh, rise and join in on this next hymn. Um, we'll be singing, Oh My Soul, Bless Your Creator, number 13 from our hymnal. Um, again, we'll, we'll uh, not be singing out loud if you're in the sanctuary, but if you're at home, let her rip. invite you to give. If you are online at home on Facebook or on Zoom, you know the link to give. If you've already pledged, made those donations, I offer a gift of thanks. There's an option if you've brought your offering, there's a place um, in the narthex and offering plates. I don't think we have offering plates in the sanctuary. They're just on your way out. Um, so don't forget to do that. The website, of course, is one great way to do that. You can click give at the top of the page. And there is a way to text your donation as well. We are certainly in the 21st century in this church. Let me tell you. All right. Pray with me in our prayer of dedication. Holy One, we offer what we can to you today. Our financial gifts matter to this church, to one another, and to the ministry that we are able to extend through our gifts. May those offered online, through text, in our pledges throughout the year, and even in person here in these offering baskets, may they be commissioned, may they be blessed into your service here. Amen. And I want to thank all of our music volunteers who week after week um, take the time 
to sing with me. I, I prepare a little track that they put in their headphones and they sing along with my voice and they sing into their smartphone. And week after week, they send me those tracks and I, I mix them together so we can have, have some, uh, uh, you know, him singing in the, in the sanctuary. So I just want to thank those people who take the time to do that because it really makes a big difference in our worship. And, um, but we're, I'm also making a point of singing one hymn live each week. So we, we still get at least a little bit of experience of live singing in our sanctuary, even if it's just one of us up here at a podium. Um, this week, our live hymn that we're going to sing is Like a Healing Stream, number 73 from our uh, Sing Prayer Praise hymnal. Um, and uh, feel free to rise and hum along if you're in the sanctuary, sing along if you're at home. This is one of my favorites. Take it away, Chad. Like a healing stream in a barren desert, spirit water bringing life to dusty earth. God is trickling through our lives as in a dream unfolding, promising revival and rebirth. Like a healing stream. Like a gentle rain on a thirsty garden, spirit water come to nourish tiny seed. God is bubbling through the soil to coax a new creation, yearning for an end to want and need. Like a gentle rain. Like a river strong with a restless current, spirit water rushing on to distant shore. God is carving out a channel in a new direction, calling for an end to hate and war. Like a river strong. Like a mighty sea, reaching far horizons, spirit water with love both deep and wide. God is working in our hearts to shape a new tomorrow. God will always challenge and provide. Like a mighty sea, like a river strong like a gentle rain, like a healing stream. I invite you to go forth in kindness, knowing when to walk away and how and when to start to ask for forgiveness and to avoid our temptations towards saviorism. May we each accompany one another into the presence of wisdom and into the presence of kindness. Amen. Announcements? That's you. So we have a few announcements. Let me get my page ready. There it is. Okay, so please stick around outside and hang out um, and have a chat. We don't have any coffee today, but we will have plenty of good conversation. So please stick around. Um, for those of you who are um, joining us virtually on Zoom or on Facebook, uh, well, actually on Zoom in particular, uh, we're having, you can have, we still have our virtual coffee hour. So we'll put you in a little room and you can chat with each other. Um, David Randall Bodman will be on vacation for the remaining month of August. There will be no open Zoom hour or midweek prayer gathering until he's back.
Stump the Pastor is coming up on September 5th. That'll be his first day back. You can add your questions to the question box on the welcome table in the narthex. So Stump the Pastor is, you know, you can base, it's basically like open-ended question. You can ask David about anything spiritual you want to ask him about, and he will give you his pastor's take on that. Um, often there are fun questions like, what's the meaning of life? And, you know, other really, really great open-ended questions. Um, those are always fun. Um, but, you know, anything kind of more pointed is, is often yields some really fun, um, fun topic for him to sermonize on. Um, so there's, and there's going to be an activity today after, after church. Um, Nikki uh, is, uh, hosting this activity where they are um, putting together uh, tiles for the Maybell Center for Community Mosaic Mural Project. And so um, basically we're uh, assembling, crafting these tiles. It'll be in the Breezeway Courtyard area. And Nikki, you'll have more information about that after church if you want to uh, participate with that. And I think that's about it for announcements, unless I'm forgetting anything, anybody, no? Okay, I think that's about it. So please hang out and enjoy Chad's postlude before we go hang out together outside.